All right, so um, yeah, uh, that's, that's a pretty good synopsis. Although um, I'd like to emphasize in this presentation that this, this idea of man in the middling as an attack factor, uh, that's a bit, that sounds a bit like, like hostile. Uh, what we're doing is we are man in the middling. Uh, you could call the man in the middle attack, but we're doing it for profit in some way. Uh, we are doing it to improve a product and to sell this as an upgrade to existing cars. And that means that I'm here as a uh, business person, and I have to acknowledge my man in the middle of the room there. Uh, this is uh, Jacques Blumberg. Uh, he and I together have the company Maxan. Um, yeah, so it's not just me. I mostly do the uh, electronic side of things um, and the yeah, well, and programming, that kind of stuff. Uh, Jacques does the mechanical engineering mostly. Um, Basically, it's a small company, so we do everything, but uh, that's the reason why I'm here and uh, he is in the uh, the audience today. So, uh, right, the theme of a business person, I am in my turtleneck, uh, people say I'm in my Steve Jobs uniform, and uh, that also means that I need to drive a flashy car, so uh, we're talking about electric cars, so here is a Fiat 500e, it's a very cool car. It's, uh, it's very nippy on the road. It, uh, it looks nice. Like it's a, it's a, it looks very small in this uh, photo, but it is, it is fairly roomy. It's, um, it's got a few downsides, like the interior. It's a bit cheap and it doesn't go very far on a battery. And, uh, well, I had this photo. It's not my car. Um, anyway. This is a cool car, right? This is a Tesla, Tesla Model S P85D. Uh, pretty much one of the best uh, electric cars on the market. Uh, it is it's really fast off the line. It's fastest car uh, production car until very shortly uh, ago. Um, yeah, really cool car. It's, uh, it's a bit expensive though. I uh, I can't really afford it. So uh, let's just move on. <clears throat> so yeah, I'm. Uh, not actually really a business person, uh, more of an engineering type. And I assume that most people here are more of the engineering persuasion. Um, so I like to, like the, the en engineer in us, we see a problem in the world. For instance, uh, I guess uh, a missing library for seeing if something is a positive integer. And we fix it by writing a library that only... Uh, tries to look at an integer and see if it's positive. Uh, we do these things where we like to just fix the world. So, for instance, we see on Thingiverse, we see this head of Stephen Colbert, and there's clearly something wrong with it. Is there anybody in the audience who knows what's wrong with this head, just looking at it? Definitely something with the mouth, yeah, and uh, the eyes and other things. Uh, everything is upside down, clearly. This, uh, this is a much better thing. An engineer, they changed the mesh and, uh, yeah, fixed it. This is what engineers do. And, um, yeah, there's this whole cornucopia of information on uh, the Internet, on GitHub, on NPM, on Thingiverse, of people trying to fix the world and sharing their improvements. Uh, but... Uh, this is my actual car. I've tried to find a nice photo of it. It's, uh, it's not a very nice looking car. Um, yeah, I, I basically gave up. I, I don't know what, to, what to do with this. But basically the car needs a body kit to be, to be actually nice. So, um, yeah, uh, this car has to be fixed. Uh, because here's the, here's the deal. We bought this car, me and my fiance bought this car a year and a half ago. Uh, it's the first car, it's our only car, and it's an electric car. And it was basically the only electric car we could afford, um, which explains the design, I guess. Um, and, uh, well, I mean, there are cheaper electric cars, but I mean, come on. This is, this is ridiculous. So, uh, there are some problems with these first generation electric cars. They have a limited range. So typical Nissan Leaf, when you buy them secondhand, they go about a hundred kilometers on a, uh, on a charge. Uh, they charge pretty slowly. So once you drive basically an hour, uh, on the highway, 
uh, you have to wait for basically an hour before it's full again at a fast charger. If you want to do this as a slow charger, yeah, it's, well, as long as you like, pretty much. It's very relaxed driving with it. And uh, this is a car from 2011, so uh, it's missing a lot of cool gadgets, things like Android Auto and Apple CarPlay, if you're of the Apple persuasion. Um, so these are problems, and how do we fix these problems? So I talked to a couple of people, and um, I'd first like to talk about the the responses I got from the other people, which was buying a different car. I don't get this this mindset of non-engineers. Why would you buy a different car if you want a better car? Kind of makes sense, though. I don't know. Um, the actual solutions, obviously, is adding extra batteries. That's, I mean, that's how you how you give it more battery capacity, right? You have the car already. You bought it because, well, reasons. Um, so, yeah, you add the extra batteries. You increase the charging speed, and you add cool gadgets, the stuff you want, uh, stuff that's in a Tesla, for instance, which I still cannot afford, even though starting a company. We should make more money. Uh, put that on the to-do list. Um, so we go to the cornucopia of the internet. Uh, there are people who have thought of this solution before, adding extra batteries to a car. And there's this whole YouTube channel. This is not my channel. This is just a, another channel that I found quite a long time ago. Um, in the last few videos he made were from two years ago. And uh, he made uh, a battery pack for a Nissan Leaf. So, you say it's possible. There's this company, apparently in 2014 already, who made a very ugly trailer that adds battery capacity to a very ugly car. I did not know that cars were so ugly. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's possible, right? And then you delve into kind of a downside of the engineer's mindset. Which is, um, this guy at Leaf Expec, he made the car work on this extra battery, and then he fried his car, and then he fixed the car and never installed the battery pack back, because, well, he basically showed it is possible, uh, I made the thing work, and now, yeah, making it into an actual product, or making it actually work in a way that is, um, uh, worry free that you can just drive around and don't have to worry about in which exact order you have to close the contactors, which was his problem. Um, most people don't really want to do that. So, um, these projects, they strand and a lot of projects strand. Uh, you can see this everywhere on GitHub and forums and people discussing possible solutions, getting like, 20% of the way there, 30% of the way there, and then stopping. So there's a lot of information on the internet, a lot of cool stuff being done, but very little of it is actually of any true value to an end customer. Uh, it's just projects. Nothing wrong, of course, with that, because <clears throat> I might have contributed quite a lot to that. But uh, yeah, this is why I think and why I want to convince you, the audience, to uh, try to do can man in the middle attacks for profit. It might be a little bit uh, specific thing to convince people of. But uh, yeah, this, this commercial incentive, that is what drives us to uh, develop this product further to the point that we can actually sell it to people. And uh, this might sound very, um, very, very money uh, centric. There was a, a presentation a little bit ago um, where the guy was talking about uh, the uh, commercial man in the middle attacks. And that's not what I mean. Um, what I mostly mean is other people caring a lot about the money they um, gave us and saying, I kind of want a product that works. And my car is now stranded. This is a, um, this is a screenshot from LeafSpy. It's a little program you can install on your phone that inspects the uh, error messages that a car uh, causes. And um, you don't need to really read all of this. Uh, this basically means the car is dead, stranded at the side of the road. People are calling me and sending uh, screenshots and saying, how do I fix this now? 
And that is uh, not fun if you have uh, 10 customers driving around with cars that don't quite work right. So there's a commercial incentive to fix the product. Anyway, when all of this is said and done, though, and this is, I think, uh, the, uh, I've been focusing a little bit on the, uh, the negatives of people complaining in, uh, to me that things don't work right. But when it works right, uh, this is transformative, especially in the EV sphere, especially with secondhand older EVs. These cars are very limited. Um, people often say on forums, well, the average commute is uh, 30 kilometers, 20 kilometers. An EV with a 100 kilometer range can do anything. It's more than enough to do anything. This customer went to the Alps uh, on holiday, this uh, summer holiday, with his range extended battery. Uh, he was able to do things like climb the Stelvio Pass, which is 2,700 meter uh, height difference from sea level to the pass. This is something that is physically impossible with the origi original car, and actually physically impossible with any of the earliest generation uh, cars. So the Nissan Leaf, the Citroen C0 that you saw, and uh, the Renault Zoe. Their batteries are too small to actually uh, bridge this height difference. So you cannot go on holiday even if there were chargers everywhere. Uh, this is a change, this this slight increase in uh, battery capacity, well, doubling, I guess, uh, is something that helps people make a second car into a first car, into a primary vehicle. So these are useful modifications. This is not a little bit useful. This is stuff that uh, transforms a car that you kind of want to sell into a car that you can keep for another 10 years. Because these cars are great mechanically. They don't fail. They just have very crappy batteries. So, anyway, uh, that was a lot of trying to convince you to do things for the good of the world. Let's go into the actual technicals. Um, so, in a car, you have bits that want to communicate to each other. Sometimes the, these bits are very simple. It's a light that has to blink on and off. You can just run a wire uh, and make the wire go on and off. That's I think that is very obvious. Um, however, in most vehicles, and especially in EVs, most of the communication going on is a little bit more complex. You want to send uh, messages that have more information in them. For instance, you want to know how deeply depressed the accelerator pedal is. In an internal combustion engine car, you can technically run a physical wire to your uh, gas valve. You cannot do that in an EV. You have to somehow instruct the motor inverter to do stuff. And you do that with messages that are fairly complex, uh, for which, through historical reasons, people have used CAN bus. And CAN bus is pretty much the standard now uh, since the end of last century for all important communication in the car. One slight exception in LIN bus. Uh, for those people, I'm not sure if everybody here has uh, has looked at the, uh, the CAN bus or uh, automotive hacking uh, thingy. Uh, but for those not quite familiar with CAN bus, uh, CAN bus is just a serial bus. Uh, it's a two-wire differential bus. Uh, everything on the bus shares those two lines, so there's no, no daisy chaining or anything. It's just two lines. Everything connects to that. And what sets CAN bus apart from uh, other serial buses is that it is bracketized. So um, it's got the differential signaling over a twisted pair, so it's enforced that you use twisted pair. Oh, sorry. Um, the uh, uh, protocol uh, layer has a built-in CRC on the entire thing. And there are even more uh, rugged features, things like bit stuffing to avoid DC bias in the signal. Uh, there is automatic retransmit. Again, this is all protocol layer. This is all stuff you don't have to actually care about if you write software for it. This is all in the CAN transceiver chips. Um, there is like uh, really cool stuff like automatic retransmission of uh, messages when they fail to transmit for some reason. Uh, there is a bus off passive mode for the startup. So in a vehicle, you often have uh, small ECUs in the uh, in the vehicle that ha need time to start up. They run on an OS of some si uh, some sort, maybe just a real time OS, but it still needs a hundred milliseconds to start up. When you start talking to it. It initiates a startup, but cannot talk back yet. So there are all kinds of very interesting um, features to fix that. 
And also, part of the ruggedization is the fact that it is very slow. Uh, to um, uh, modern standards, one megabit per second is nothing. And this is the uh, bit transmission rate, the bit, uh, bit rate of the um, canvas itself. In fact, as you will see on the next slide, one megabit per second actually means you can only transmit about one to 2,000 messages per second over the bus without overloading it. <clears throat> so this is a can frame, and uh, what I want to convey to you here is that it's actually very simple. I'm not sure if I chose the correct image for that. Um, but it is actually very simple. So what you see here is the complexities of the signal. There is um, this here are the actual physical canvas lines, and here again, uh, doing all kinds of stuff. And there are, there's an arbitration field, and there's here, here's the CRC. It's a 15 bit CRC, very cool. And there is a special end of frame thing to make sure that you're making the bus passive again. And all of that is irrelevant. All you need to know about CAN is that it uses an ID. That's part of, that's this green bit. And it has data, one to eight bytes. There's only one byte here in the red area. And that's it. That is CAN. There is no more information useful or relevant to the end user than the ID and the data. So, now we know this. We have a rudimentary understanding of CAN. Um, we can look at the consequences. And here I want to go into the mindset of somebody trying to reverse engineer or, uh, or do things like man-in-the-middle attacks, figuring out what is going on on the bus and how can I use this information to change behavior of the car. So the bus is shared, and it is a surprisingly useful um, uh, consequence of the bus. Uh, there, There is no directionality. Everything is shared on two lines, so you cannot know where a uh, message originates and where it's going to. You can never know where it's going to, but I will show you that there is a way with the man-in-the-middle attack to show where it came from. Um, there is, uh, because everything is shared, nodes have to wait for each other to stop talking before they can start a transmission. So there is no definite timing. There's not even definite ordering of messages. Uh, there are a few CAN protocols like FDCAN that can do this. That is a pun, sorry for that. Um, but uh, no, in, in general, Canvas has no definite timing or ordering. And the most interesting feature that we're going to use, uh, we're going to exploit, is the messages are extremely short. Eight bytes at the maximum. That is almost no payload. That is basically impossible to do any kind of encryption that you cannot just rainbow table in a second in Lua or something. Like, even the most inefficient way to crack that is going to be very fast. So, nobody bothers. Um, you also have to be very thrifty with your messages. So the messages often contain just an integer value. They don't contain any special padding or uh, strange uh, state machines or that kind of stuff. Even if they contain state machines, they are often like a nibble, four bits, not even a full byte. Uh, this is really useful for reverse engineering. All right. So we've uh, seen everything we need to know to go and look at um, the Nissan Leaf EV CAN. So this is the CAN bus that runs between all the drivetrain components. Uh, I will just very quick, quickly go into the uh, lingo for Nissan. Uh, this is common to most um, Japanese cars, by the way. So there's the VCM. This is the vehicle control module. Uh, you can see this as the uh, main computer inside uh, any Nissan uh, vehicle. Then, for some reason, the air conditioning is connected to the EV CAN. This is because the air conditioning runs on the um, uh, main high voltage battery. There's the TCU, the telecommunications control unit. Uh, might talk about that a little bit later. Uh, there's a shifter. You would think there are no gears in an electric car, but you still need to put your car into park and drive. There's a traction motor inverter. I don't know if Nissan uses a uh, acronym for that. The onboard charger and the lithium battery control. This is basically the battery. And one thing that is clearly missing for an entire drivetrain is 
where is the electron and the brake pedal? They're not on here. Obviously, I drew this in uh, Inkscape, so I could ju just have left it off, but really, it is not on the EV canvas. It is somewhere else. Where could it be? Well, obviously, it's not going to be in the air conditioning unit. It's not going to be in any of these. Uh, it would be very, very um, interesting to put it directly on the traction motor, but that is not possible because you have to depress the brake pedal to start the car, and the traction motor inverter is not on at that point, so it cannot be anywhere in this chain. It has to be relayed from the VCM, and there has to be something here that is uh, connected to a different bus or a different direct connection that sends messages to the traction motor. So let's reverse engineer this. Let's try to see how a man-in-the-middle attack is useful in looking at uh, modifying, for instance, the response of your pedals to uh, to this electric vehicle. For, for instance, to improve performance, to increase power, to do anything you like. So here is the man in the middle module. <laughs> this is what the whole talk is about. I uh, photographed it in its um, natural habitat on a bit of carpet in the car. Yes. The VCM is somewhere here. I have very crudely soldered this. This is literally the prototype car. I'm still driving like this. So if people are in my, on the passenger side, they have to like scoot their feet to the side a little bit because I basically, I want to be able to physically work on these wires at any time. Anyway, the man in the middle attack happens here. So why do we do that? Uh, let's just uh, take a look at what the man in the middle board does. So here we have the output of the man in the middle uh, board. These are cam messages, and I'll just quickly go through the, uh, the actual meaning of all these lines of code. So the first column shows where the messages are originating from. So in uh, this particular uh, example, uh, number one, bus number one is connected to the VCM, and bus number two is connected to the rest. So you can see that there are actually a lot of messages going from two to one, obviously because there are more nodes connected to uh, bus two than to bus one, and some go the other way as, as well. The second column shows the uh, the ID, and uh, I put on uh, uh, on a slide before that this ID can be either 11 or 29 bits, Obviously, these are only 11-bit IDs. Then the third column shows the data. So this is uh, all uh, in sequence, the eight bytes that uh, uh, can exist on the canvas. You can see uh, the data length is not, is not always the same. Uh, here is one message that is only six bytes long. Here's one that's only one byte long. So we want to know these motor control messages. How do we, we start identifying this? We have a very, very small slice. Just to be clear, this is about three dozen messages on the CAN bus. The CAN bus has uh, a couple hundred messages per second, so this is a fraction of a second. Still though, this should be enough information for us to identify our target message, to decode it, because uh, these motor control messages, they have to be very fast. Uh, if you move your pedal around, or do anything, or if the car uh, decides to make an emergency stop, it has to respond within tens of milliseconds, maybe a hundred milliseconds. So this should be enough. We should see very frequent messages that are related to the motor, converter, to the traction uh, motor. Uh, they have to go from the VCM to the inverter. So they have to be messages that go from one to two. And uh, they have to have some kind of plausible data that looks like motor control data. We don't know for sure what it looks like yet, but we'll figure it out. So uh, we can just cross out everything that goes from bus two to one, very, very simply. Uh, we know that the messages that we're looking for have to be going in this direction. And this is why this man in the middle attack is so powerful. You can just immediately erase 90% of all your messages um, by exploiting the directionality of uh, being in the middle of a canvas. <clears throat> now we see that there are only three IDs left. This is, I mean, it's an old car. Uh, I can imagine that newer electric cars have many more IDs that, that could be eligible, but this one only has D, uh, three. 
It's got uh, 1d4, 1f2, and 50c right here. The rest is all 1d4, 1f2, 1d4, 1f2, 1d4, 1f2, etc. This 50c message doesn't happen often enough. We can discount it fairly easily by the fact that it's just it only happens probably once every 100 milliseconds or slower. It's just uh, a chance encounter with this message in this particular part of the trace. So um, let's just trace these messages in particular. This, by the way, is Notepad++, if anybody recognizes the search function. Um, uh, I just uh, selected all of the one of two messages in the log. And we can see that uh, this, this is a trace while driving, while manipulating the uh, electron paddle. And uh, it's not doing anything. Like, every message is identical except for around the end, but this seems to be periodic. So there's this one, two, three, zero, one, two, three, zero, goes on periodically. Same for the last byte. So by elimination, 1d4 has to be the traction motor um, message. There's just no other way. So let's look at that. Here's the 1d4 trace. And uh, immediately we can see that there's a lot of static data in there as well. They're not being very thrifty with their messages. So the first two bytes, completely static. These two bytes are actually not bytes. They're, there's the last nibble of this byte and the first nibble of this one, all static. This uh, last byte is like all over the place. 5C, 9B, B2, 7, 5, etc. So does anybody recognize what this could possibly be? What's, what's a good candidate? Yes, exactly. It's a CRC. So uh, it's a CRC with, uh, in this case, um, uh, root uh, hex 85, I think. Why they do this? I don't know. This is only an 8-bit CRC. It's not even a good one because it's only on 7 bytes. There's already a 15-bit CRC in CAN bus. So... Like, this is much uh, more likely to, to collide, especially if you um, uh, stack CRCs. So I don't know why they do this. It's, it's, they have this in multiple messages on the Nissan Leaf CAN bus. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's obviously a CRC. So we're left with... Uh, oh, of course, sorry. Uh, we have another bit of periodic data here. This goes uh, 48C, 48C, 0, 48C. Obviously periodic. And by elimination, this has to be the motor control word. There is nothing on the bus just by elimination. This is the only thing that could ever be a motor control signal. And we can see that it varies a little bit randomly. It goes from FFP to FF9. It's clearly signed. Uh, so because the first bit and basically all of the bits uh, at the top of the, um, the word are ones, uh, this is probably a negative thing. So at this point, I must have been braking, I guess, or at least the traction motor must have been braking. Uh, but like clearly, that has to be it. That's how you do reverse engineering on a CAN bus with a man in the middle attack. This is a very quick attack. Uh, this way, you can figure out functionality in the car in a matter of like tens of minutes, uh, even including setup. So super useful, super nice. I've only talked about the attack part. Now let's go and see how you can actually do any uh, good with it. So we uh, compile all of these things into a big Excel document. This is a, uh, not actually something that I compiled at all. This is something that has uh, existed uh, for four or five years. People on the Minus and Leaf uh, Internet Forum have compiled this from uh, just sniffing CAM packets, not even man in the middling it but just sniffing it. And there's a lot of missing data, uh, stuff that I've, uh, in, within our company, have been able to figure out. Uh, so this was already existent, and you can see there's a lot of information they could already glean from just looking at traces, looking at uh, sniffed CAM packages. So what can you do? Well, we can impo uh, improve uh, the car. We can put the batteries in, but obviously putting the batteries in is not enough. You have to report to the user 
that there is actually more capacity in the car. Otherwise, they would have no idea how far they could drive before the battery goes empty. So, one of the uh, possibilities for using this man in the middle attack for good is increasing the reported battery capacity. So, we just look for the message, the only message, a 10 bit value uh, on bit of, or on byte 0 and the top two bits of byte 1 that represents the available charge signal. So, this is the name for how much is left in your battery. Uh, and you modify it, and voila, it works. Uh, you get the correct uh, amount of kilometers or miles on your dash and the user can use their extender battery as normal. Um, we can increase regener regenerative braking. So um, this is a bug in uh, especially the oldest generation uh, of Nissan Leaf where as the battery pack degrades slightly uh, the car just refuses to use regenerative braking. And you can imagine regenerative braking is when you break and put the energy back into the uh, battery instead of uh, using your brake pads and just losing it, uh, all that kinetic energy as heat. Uh, it's really useful, especially with these tiny batteries that the uh, old cars have, to use regenerative braking in uh, stop-and-go traffic to save some energy. So it's very annoying that for some reason there's some bug in uh, Nissan's firmware originally as they programmed it 10 years, maybe more than 10 years ago, where the uh, battery messages are misinterpreted to show that the battery has very high internal resistance and cannot cope with uh, regenerative braking as well. And you would get the uh, effect that the car basically had no regenerative braking. Um, even as the battery gets very empty, there was still no, not full regenerative braking. Um, the regenerative braking is, or uh, the general power is uh, shown by these bubbles. So if these bubbles um, yeah, show up on your dashboard, <laughs> I guess, you can use that power. So to the right, this little white blip, that's the current uh, power being used. Going to the right is power being used for acceleration, and going to the left is power being used for regenerative braking, and you can see that all five regenerative bubbles are uh, available, even though this uh, car is fully charged and has the extender battery. So this is uh, extremely useful. For instance, this client that went to the Alps, uh, he was able to recoup a couple of kilowatt hours going down in the Stelvio Pass, even though his battery was still fairly full. Uh, it saved him a lot of kilometers of range, uh, which would not be possible with uh, the unmodified car. And of course, uh, this is the thing I did uh, last. So the original Leaf had an estimated range of about 100 kilometers. If the battery was completely full, if it was a really nice day, you would get uh, an indicated range of maybe 120, 130 kilometers. Uh, I've upgraded my car to about 500 kilometers of range, up to about 60 kilowatt hours. Uh, using a completely foreign battery, well, actually the battery from a newer generation Nissan Leaf. So the original batteries were about 25, 24 kilowatt hours. The new ones are 40. I have the extender battery in my uh, trunk, so altogether I have about 60 kilowatt hours uh, in place of the original degraded 24 kilowatt hour battery, which actually had more like 15 or 16 kilowatt hours of usable capacity left. So this is a massive improvement, and the only reason this is possible is because we have the man in the middle doing translation between the newer uh, Nissan battery and the old um, Nissan computer. If you would not have this, obviously the battery wouldn't understand anything happening in the car, and vice versa. And uh, yeah, this is almost the range of the Tesla Model 3, so that's why this is just a clickbait headline. Anyway. <laughs> uh, what's the time, roughly? Uh, I don't have a... How much time do I have left? I should probably uh, see if there are any questions. Uh, before I try to do this. All right, so uh, what I tried to show today is that uh, man-in-the-middle attacks on Canvas are not just a security issue. Um, I have a lot more to tell about the security side, side of things as well, but in this talk, it's just uh, I want to show you can improve old cars, especially old EVs. Uh, it's a complete waste that these cars are basically only being used as shopping cars 
going 20 kilometers at, at a time um, to, to get groceries, maybe be a convenient car to give to uh, your kid because it doesn't go very far and doesn't go very fast. Um, I mean, these cars are just mechanically completely good. They're ugly as sin, but if you can get over that, they're still very fun to drive. It's an electric car. It's still got loads of torque. Uh, it is a good car, and it's just got this bad battery. And if we just fix that bad battery, do the engineering approach, we can make these into cars that can drive another 20 years, probably. Uh, they're super reliable. So uh, I think that we should be using <laughs> our security efforts in this field for good, for uh, trying to, yeah, repurpose these old cars, give them a new lease on life. Uh, so, yeah, that's it. Uh, any questions? Yeah, I have a, I have a question. Um, you, uh, on the slide, you said you didn't exactly know why the AC communicated on the canvas. I was wondering whether the whether the uh, the environmental control system was also did the environmental controls for the batteries. <laughs> well, um, Nissan is one of these companies that uh, decided that even though their battery overheats all the time, they don't need any battery cooling or battery. Well, they do have battery heaters in very very cold climates. Did I do the thing? I think, yes. Um, yeah, they have almost no thermal management in batteries. So, um, no, the, the AC uh, only is on there because of the TCU, actually. So the telecommunication uh, control unit, it's a little box uh, that um, uh, connects to a cellular network. It's always on, uh, and it has the capability of um, starting up the entire um, CAN bus so you can uh, remotely log into your car, see how full the battery is, if it's still charging, and also remotely start the AC, start the heating, and uh, do that kind of stuff. So that's the only reason it's on there. Uh, it's still a bit weird. There are other ways of doing this, but I mean, that's the actual reason, I think. I mean, I don't know the design specs, so. All right, any more questions? Hi. I assume that you uh, added batteries rather than replacing them to give you the extra capacity. Is there any difference between the new batteries that you added in terms of their ability to charge compared with the old the, ones? Yeah. And did that give you some any problems in the way that you may have some difference between the new batteries charging and the old batteries charging? Um, yes. Uh, there are quite large differences, and uh, we're actually um, specifically exploiting the fact that the batteries that we use um, have a much lower internal resistance. They are uh, much higher performance uh, batteries. They come from plug-in hybrids. They're very small batteries that have to give oodles of uh, power. Um, so these batteries can give and accept much uh, higher power. Uh, they don't heat up nearly as much, so you can increase charging speed. You can increase discharging speed if you want. Uh, so you can up the motor power and still have like decent performance and decent, uh, decently slow degradation. They also um, have a different charge characteristic from the original battery, which means that uh, you uh, remove a lot of stress from the original, from the main battery, uh, also slowing down degradation and uh, basically making everything better. This is like, it's not really security or a hardware thing, it's more a battery chemistry thing. Uh, but yeah, uh, of course, that also gives problems, for instance, in the, um, uh, you cannot just use voltage based capacity estimation on these batteries you have to do strange battery you, you have to do a whole new battery management system but uh i mean that's kind of what i do so i'm familiar with that that that's not really a problem for me anymore hi um assuming uh while driving this man in the middle component crashes what will be the effect of not passing these messages uh the car will stop functioning uh, but <laughs> will the brakes stop functioning, or will the car uh, just no, so, slow? No, so this is uh, this is also why the brake pedal is not in this loop. Uh, there are um, so uh, specifically the uh, brake component ha has to be from a safety pers uh, perspective uh, has to have double action. So it's got uh, the just the, the digital communication with the VCM, but it's also got a backup connection, special mechanical connection that you can hear when you start up the car. Um, that when uh, the car loses communication with its traction motor, it, it engages a little pawl 
and it directly um, connects to your uh, hydraulic cylinders and uh, gives you the ability to brake uh, mechanically. So the brake pedal will still work. Accelerator won't work. Basically, nothing else will. Your 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 infotainment will work. Uh, that's it, basically. So, all right. So my question is about the safety, not the security. In your experience, what are the safety implications of adding a new battery? And did did you learn any lessons from doing this? Well, fortunately, we didn't learn any lessons. <laughs> lessons. <laughs> uh, this is a kind of a complicated thing again. Um, a really a security thing again. Uh, uh, did we learn anything? Yeah, we learned lots. I don't really know how to limit the scope of this question, honestly. We'll, we can talk about this later, because I think there are more people uh, with questions. Yeah? yeah. Uh, Do you want to share with us the uh, material costs of this upgrade? Uh, uh, do you mean... Like the entire battery pack and everything, or yeah, just yeah. manual attack? Not not your uh, own investment, but uh, material costs. Uh, sorry, do you mean per unit, like what we sell it for, or? Nee, wat je er zelf aan kwijt bent uh, uh, geweest? Um, too too much money. Lots of lots of. <laughs> we we haven't really uh, made much money from the company, even though we've had about a uh, hundred thousand euros of turnover. So. That should give uh, an idea of uh, we s we still need to go into mass production to recoup all that cost. A lot of cost, <laughs> I would say, <laughs> into yeah into the entire company. We have time for one more question. Hi, what was Nissan's response? <laughs> we purposefully haven't really talked to Nissan about this. <laughs> So no response. <laughs> I I'm not sure if they will have very much of a response. Uh, there's also this very big language barrier between um, uh, b between the higher ups at uh, Nissan and the uh, this kind of development. I'm not sure if they're really interested in their products being modified overseas too much. Uh, yeah, yeah, somebody still has a question, but I, I think we are out of time. Uh, if okay. we can take it off, good. Stage. Yeah, we'll talk later. Yeah. Thank you, Amir. All right, thank you.